All right. Uh, well, our next um, speaker is Dr. Nan. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Nandini Bhattacharya. Uh, she is the Distinguished Fellow at the Asian Confluence at Meghala, India, and she will be presenting on creating digital museums uh, regarding a case study. Dr. Nandini, uh, please, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Um, I'm extremely grateful to Dr. Muhammad Jav Akhtar Javed for inviting me. I'm, I'm a historian. I'm not a museum professional. Therefore, I'm privileged and honored to share some of my ideas. Um, I will speak on indigenous community and digital museum, case study of the lecture community in Sikkim and Darjeeling. <coughs> a historian by training, I engage myself in studying and documenting the tradi tradition and cultural heritage of the indigenous communities in the Eastern Himalayas and Nepal out of my keen interest and passion. I've seen during the course of my research how the indigenous stroke tri tribal communities in India have excuse endured- Excuse me, Dr. Dr. Nandini, excuse me. Uh, can you adjust your camera, please? Because we, we are yes, looking absolutely. at the ceiling rather than on your face. So oh, yeah, okay. yeah, it's it's better. It's better. A little bit more, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, they have endured cultural homogenization and dis displacement of the ethnic memory over centuries, especially through the passage of colonization. These communities still face the challenge of physical and cultural survival and the impact of and the pandemic, impact of the pandemic on their uh, on the marginalized, discriminated indigenous tribes have turned the scenario even worse. And that is the global perspective, not only in India. India is the, actually, I will speak from a historian's perspective from a historian's perspective. And um, I have no, I'm not sharing any photograph. Anything. Potentially uh, reflections, uh, some reflections from my research, we, which I want to share with some core museum professionals who are distinguished and eminent. So I, I wouldn't have time if I would have shared photos and my theoretical presentation. India is a plural, or to use the post-colonial paradigm, a multicultural society. The country is inhabited by myriad communities, big and small, powerful and weak, oral and textual, etc. Those communities apparently have no history, written or documented. Or to be precise, they are hidden from history. Therefore, they are hidden, they, they have very little visibility. However, most of this community, as I have seen, possess rich ethnocultural, linguistic, and aesthetic tradition. And some even have tangible heritage sites, though in ruins, to claim a tangible and glorious history in the past. I observed as a social science scholar that since the British period, the indigenous communities categories, categorized as tribe in India by the British have become specimens of anthropological research by othering them, othering the code from the mainstream and the tradition still continues, more or less. The anthropologists recorded their physiognomy, characteristic traits, such as violent and primitive um, rituals relating to marriage, birth and death, legend and myth. The discourses had been primarily generated to create a binary dominant versus marginal, mainstream versus peripheral, the other of such communities. Only if there are 
for example, like Pitt River Museum in Oxford, the objects belong to other India, other within Co. The Lepcha community and Sikh of Sikkim and Darjeeling belong to this other India, the marginal and peripheral hidden from history. As I found out through my research in century before the advent of the British in the region, the Lepcha community was the original inhabitants or the indigenous community of Sikkim and Darjeeling. They used to describe the land as my land, which was within, 50, within half a century of the British rule. Uh, and the hidden paradise no longer remained hidden. Um, after the British advent, the history took its own course leaving the Lepcha community to embrace a debased existence. Like almost all other indigenous community in the world, the Lepcha community became subjected to displacement, dispossession, and marginalization to accommodate the conqueror's agenda or design that collaborate with the British in the empire building process and they paid the price. The rulers acquired human resources for building the imperial in infrastructure. They encouraged migration from neighboring countries and especially from Nepal and also Bihar, Bengal. The Lepcha community was forced to surrender their land for building the imperial infrastructure and accommodating the newly arrived people in the region. Most importantly, tea. Tea gardens, Darjeeling tea, celebrated Darjeeling tea, covering the vast expanse of the land, which <clears throat> uh, displaced them from their land. Within a few decades, the community had to withdraw to the remote corners of the hill, being displaced, impoverished, and marginalized. Disposition from uh, ancestral land was not the only criteria to describe them as the displaced community. With the establishment of the empire, the missionaries started coming in the region. They proselytized the impoverished and helpless <clears throat> lepchas in mass. The lepchas were not an oral community in the pre-colonial time. They had language. script and the poetry and poetic. Lepcha language was the official language in Darjeeling and Sikkim before the coming of the British. The language had been abandoned <clears throat> as the medium of uh, medium in official correspondence in less than 10 years. The language to translate the Bible in Lepcha language as a means to enhance the number of conversion. The Lepcha language no longer remains the medium of aesthetic or daily correspondence in the community. By the end of the 19th century, the Lepcha language and culture had been drawn under the mass homogenized process. The, the Lepcha community in Sikkim and Darjeeling attained the attribute of a dying race, dying race within court. It was, uh, it was uh, attributed by the British by the end of the 19th century. A reserve had been created in Jongu, similar in Australia or in New Zealand or in other parts uh, uh, in the hemisphere. Uh, created in Jongu, not Sikkim, apparently to protect the pristine culture of the community in the end of the 19th century. It is debatable whether the inhabitants of Jongu are able to preserve their quintessential cultural tradition or whether the very idea of a reserve is anachronistic in a society who remained in the threshold of embracing the paradigms of modernity and progress introduced with the advent of the British in the region. Most importantly, the lectures lost their history. The most ominous feature in the process of cultural displacement is their history had been rewritten in the mainstream narratives, especially in the colonial 
ethnographic and anthropological discourses during the late 19th and early 20th century. That, that history uh, is still situated within the binary of primitive within quotes and modern within quotes, savage and civilized within quotes and other within quotes and us within quotes. Following the colonial period, steady marginalization process of the left community left this community in the periphery in the multi-ethnic and multiracial social societal setup. The community already became depressed and weak so to effectively resist the process of homogenization. However, the Lepcha community did not become disconnected with their cultural memory and ethnic past. In recent time, the state of Sikkim had been offering incentives to trace, preserve, and protect their cultural heritage. And the Lepcha community in Kalimpam, they are, they are very powerful. And conscious community and they are they are they have chosen to uh, on their own and it is a very powerful trajectory like most mar marginal communities in india the, the world and the world that lived to new paradigms of modernity and progress the member of the community in sikkim respond positively to the new opportunities to equalize with the mainstream communities. However, the story of development, progress, and modernization of the tribal communities in, North, in Northeast India during colonial and post-colonial period is not simple. Intellectuals, activists, and even the stakeholders raise criticism that the development agenda within quotes resulted or results in loss of tradition and culture and ultimately lead to further homo homogenization. In the case of the Lipchas, majority of the Lipchas um, have already been subjected to this displacement and homogenization over several centuries. If community should involve the program to ensure the material progress, at the same time, one should be cautious that this process should not lead to further homogenization uh, or displacement of, a, of one of the oldest communities in that world. Their culture, tradition, and innermost inner, emotions about relationship, relationship, human relationship, and man-nature relationship should be preserved and projected, protected. Preservation and protect, protection of the cultural heritage of the lectures would on one hand enable the community to encounter the dominant and mainstream with self-esteem and dignity. And on the other, the knowledge would enlighten a larger society about the value verification of the cultural heritage of the lecture community since 2006. Um, I've written a book, uh, Culture Heritage and um, Tradition Cultural Heritage of the uh, uh, Indigenous Community in Darjeeling and Sikkim. Uh, and also, I have prepared a documentary film under the title, The Lecture Community in Darjeeling and Sikkim quest for their root. This film is on their history, memory, and uh, history and memory uh, in Darjeeling and Sikkim. Or more apparently, how currently the literature community perceive and want to digitally showcase their history, history within quotes, a history inexorably linked with the passage of their marginalization and later on in the post-colonial period, their politics of identity. During my research on documentation and making the documentary film, I interviewed a large number of people 
who shared their memories about the ethnic trait, traits, cultural past, and tradition. Of course, the documentation process involved capturing of the surviving sites, such as old lift houses, flora and fauna, all surviving textual traditions, um, traditional food, uh, and those, and also a lot on the language, particularly uh, the poetry, the liturgical text, the Namta Namta, uh, even the reading the old texts and the and how, how the people, uh, how the young generation is getting into the 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 knowledge of their tradition. Um, those the community claims as the integral part of their history. At the same time, the cultural tradition as it is replayed in the form of song, dance, theatrical performance, rituals, etc. And no need to mention that the documentation had been conducted in the digital way. We were heartily welcomed by the Lepcha community to document their memory, religious traits, linguistic development, old legend and myth, historical sites, aesthetic tradition, and they claim that all these are integral part of their past history and their ethnic identity. The documentation project fitted within their roadmap while it engages in documenting memory and present cultural life, which somehow has reference to the past. The Lepchas living in Sikkim and Darjeeling are very keen to preserve their tradition and culture cultural heritage for the posterity. And they think this is their solemn duty to preserve and protect and to create a digital archive of their tradition and heritage. Most interestingly, Sonam Sering Lepcha, a musical maestro, a Nunajarian visionary leader, leader who just recently died last year, and a cultural icon, built an ethno-history museum in Kalimpong. Very few people know that, but he built it by his single-handed initiative. Interestingly, the museum displayed history from primitive days till the advent of colonialism. The museum had been designed uh, as a symbol of their indigenous past, a past when they had no shackles, no hegemony, no attributes, of a dying race. A small room housed this museum in Kalimpong, showcasing the liminal past of the oldest community who are offering valiant resistance against defacement of their cultural, uh, cultural heritage in the, in the larger uh, cultural canvas of India and the world. Unfortunately, Sonam Sering Lepcha has died and the museum is closed. There is no initiative as yet to open the museum or to keep all the artifacts in a better condition and in a, and um, uh, and to and to arrange larger visibility of the artifacts of of one of the most ancient communities in the world. I would conclude by saying that the notion of museum is fundamentally transformed now and democratized. From the site of colonial glory, it is gradually entering into the domain of people's history. Digital archive is, or museum is no longer a futuristic project. It is necessary that this technology should be applied on a larger scale and systematically to preserve and protect the cultural heritage and memory of the marginal indigenous communities like the Lepchas, and it should be applied throughout the world. There are a few two points to be addressed in this context. One is fund. Fund should be available to, uh, I mean, generously to conduct this noble job i would say this is noble job and secondly this initiative 
should not be the project of dominant social group. It should embrace the methodology of researcher community participation, keeping an equal, equal, uh, equally visible voice of the marginals. For that, the, the, the members of the community should be educated and trained and thereby empowered to assume an equal role with the authority and the dominant, dominant people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nandini, for this insightful presentation. Uh, well, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Amreshwar uh, to give us his perspective about your presentation. I'll say once again, you call it on me. <laughs> yeah, because you are well, the keynote speaker. <laughs> no, no, keynote speaker, you've done your job, right? You asked the questions. But Professor Nandini, nice to see you and listen to you. Uh, I think she's laid out on the table the range of challenges and problems. And uh, my own little journey is working on the uh, World Heritage Inscription of Darjeeling Himalayan Railway. What, what was shocking is that uh, until the uh, Chogyal of Sikkim ceded Darjeeling to the British uh, in 1857, 1858, the lectures were the majority population. And then they withdrew. And uh, so while I was working on the World Heritage site, only 1% of the population was lecture from being predominantly lecture. But there's hope for the future. Uh, if you look at University of Gangtok, um, uh, there are you know, lecture scholars who are teaching. Uh, one of them uh, did studied at Center for Historical Studies, Jai Jawaharlal Nehru University, good historian. Another one is right now, as we talk, finishing a uh, you know, visitorship at Harvard University. So there's a whole next generation that's coming up who are asking serious questions as to you know, the layers of history that are still there, the memories that are still there, and the sense of urgency that's there to document, to revitalize, various intangible heritage that's possible to, that's still viable. And I think that thanks to some foundation work by people like Professor Nandini, the next generation can actually rehabilitate, decolonize, you know, a lot of the history and, but also, you know, sort of, uh, they're still seen, the lectures are still seen like noble savages in the Garden of Eden in that anthropological paradigm. And uh, so the first voice of the lectures is going to be very important, you know, in decolonizing the discourse. But anyway, thanks, Professor Nandini, nice to see you. And thanks for your- Thank you, Thank you Professor. Hey, I know how difficult it is, the kind of work that you're doing, but it, it needs champions like you to fight for, uh, you know, recognition of Thank indigenous, Thank indigenous cultural systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Amreshwar. Actually, your you know your thoughts uh, and your comments are such great inspiration for all the speakers. That's why I keep on you know requesting you. All right. Oh. <laughs> uh, so all, all people still have some value. That's good to know. No. <laughs> Thank just, you very I'm much. Just joking. Mm -hmm. just, yeah, just joking. All right. So our. Um, sorry, we have a little bit of disturbance. Um, next, now, um, I would like to invite our final presenter of the day, uh, Ms. Madiha Ahmad Khan. Uh, she is the assistant professor and head textile at the National College of Arts in Rawalpindi, Pakistan. And she will be presenting on a contemporary Namda tapestries serving a beautification. Um, Ms. Madiha, are you with us? Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm here. Yeah, thank you, Mina. No worries. Please, uh, okay. yes, please, please share your screen. Yeah.
So yes, uh, today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a contemporary Namda, uh, Namda tapestry serving as a beautification. So uh, Namda uh, is a fabric, uh, a non-woven fabric made from uh, uh, made from sheep's wool hair. Uh, so uh, it's an indigenous craft uh, of uh, South Asia. Um, so what I am going to do, what I am doing is that uh, uh, I am trying to uh, revive the craft because uh, the craftsmen, uh, it's the, the craft is dying in my country due to the uh, limited resources or the craftsmen are stopped uh, working in this craft. So as a uh, textile designer, visual artist, and uh, educationist, I thought it's my responsibility to do something for uh, the, the craft people. So I'm serving at NCA as, a, as an assistant professor and head of textile design department. It's the oldest, uh, oldest art school in Pakistan and second oldest in South Asia. NCA has five departments, fine arts, design, film, TV, musical, musicology, and architecture. Uh, the college runs faculty and student exchange programs. Uh, uh, Namda. Namda is the oldest form of textile preceding weaving. It's a thick non-woven fabric made from sheep's wool or animal fur subjected to a series of processes. Uh, 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 we can find the finest namdas in the high attitudes of Pakistan, like Hunza, Gilgit, Baltistan, and Azad Kashmir, and uh, uh, Chitral as well. So you can see the uh, this uh, this piece uh, in which uh, there are many uh, 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 there is a flora and fauna uh, depicted with the embroidery techniques on a uh, plain uh, matted. Uh, 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 sheep's wool namda. Uh, in Pakistan, uh, uh, the in Pakistan we can find sheep hair from Sindh, Punjab, Kashmir, uh, Gilgit, Baltistan, and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. So these are the regions where uh, where we can find finest wool uh, for pelting. Uh, the most uh, finest wool uh, we find uh, from higher attitudes because uh, the material is very soft over there. Uh, and uh, as we, uh, we come uh, towards the, uh, the deserted areas, uh, the fiber is, uh, the, uh, the hair is more thick and it's more like, uh, it's, uh, it, it's a bit hard to uh, rub it and make a fabric. So the finest and the soft fiber we find from the higher attitudes, uh, mostly from Kashmir. So origin of Namda. Uh, felt is expected to have originated in India. And uh, uh, we can also uh, find uh, some findings uh, according to my research from uh, pre, uh, from the Neolithic period, uh, 6,500. Uh, to six, uh, 6300 BCE. In Greeks and Roman, the soldiers were equipped with felted piece, uh, plates for protection from arrows, tunics, boots, and socks. The Chinese accidentally invented felt by putting wool under a saddle for padding. Europeans shared the same belief as Chinese, except that for Europeans, it was a saintly pilgrim who put wool inside his sandals. For the Arabs, it was a camel driver who did the same. Even Nu is credited uh, felt invention, credited for felt invention. Uh, it is said after constructing the ark, he placed wool fibers on the floor for warmth and comfort. Actually, uh, when we uh, uh, when we put wool uh, uh, sheep's hair somewhere and uh, by sweat or by rubbing it. Uh, 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 fabric is the, uh, uh, we can make a fabric out of it. Properties of felt. Uh, absorbency creates comfort. Material structure creates flexibility, absorbency, uh, resilience, and ripple recovery property. Wool can absorb up to 30% of its weight in water without being wet. It absorbs moisture. In cold 
medium temperature and it produces heat, uh, giving a warm effect. The reverse occurs in sweaty summers when the moisture in the clothes pass into the atmosphere, thus giving a cooling effect. Tiny pores in the cuticle cells allow water a vapor to pass through the wool fiber. This makes wool comfortable to wear in both warm and cool conditions. It also absorbs and retains uh, uh, dyes and stuff very well, helps remove sweat and absorbs odor. Uh, type of felting. Uh, there are many types of felting. Uh, 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 craft and art felting. In craft and art felting, we create 3D products out of it. We, you can see uh, this uh, flower. It's, uh, uh, we call it uh, craft felting. Needle felting is uh, something uh, on plain matting. We use needle and we uh, pull the, uh, we push uh, the felt hairs and pull it and we, uh, we create patterns uh, from that needle. So wet felting is a process in which we can create products. So these are the three uh, major processes. This is a wet felting. Wet felting is when you use water and typically sap to help felt the fibers together. In this process, the fibers migrate together in all directions, blending them when wet felting, you are typically creating a piece of handmade felt fabric. Actually, uh, with uh, uh, wet felting, we can make products without stitching. You can see we made this uh, a cat house. Uh, it's not stitched. Uh, it's only made up of felt. And when we uh, uh, when we uh, subjected it to the uh, uh, subjected it rubbing uh, uh, after rubbing it, uh, so we created it with the uh, with uh, with the uh, uh, by providing uh, the soap and uh, uh, and detergent uh, by using soaps and detergents, uh, we made this product. So this is called uh, when we make three D products. This is called wet felting, and this is needle felting. Uh, we made poster out of it by using traditional patterns of chitral. This is also a tea cozy. Uh, so we made it uh, with the traditional patterns of uh, uh, chitral. Uh, we made it. Uh, and uh, these are the some other products. You can see the shoes and uh, uh, this is a bag made of wet felting. valued a uh, uh, craft of cottage industry in Pakistan from the longest time. According to the Heritage Craft As Association of Pakistan, some of the crafts like Namda felting are now in the hands of aging population and at a risk of fading away in the next five years. It is said that there are few original samples of old craft, uh, felted craft left in the Hunza region. Old Namda artifacts uh, often decay and get destroyed due to the poor uh, conservation processes Excuse in our me. Uh, country. Excuse me, Miss Madiha. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but then, yeah. you know, uh, we will be out in a minute. So let me interrupt okay. you for a while. And um, 